trying to control employees shopping during the day. They go to Macy's, they go to places. <laughs> and I think that, you know, forget the, the time waste, just as that may be more vulnerable because they may have gone into an unsecure website, they're going to Target, they're doing their pick up groceries from stop and shop or whatever it's called. Is there a way to control that? So my opinion is that when you talk about sites like the ones you're describing, that's really the lowest level of threat from a detection and management point of view right now. The technology is pretty good at that. We're not likely to find ourselves with even basic good technology around our networks getting compromised because somebody went to Amazon.com. Um, I would also argue that culturally speaking, the world's shifted a lot. There was a time when everybody brought briefcases to work, right? And they were they would sit at their desk and every once in a while they'd open their briefcase and maybe there was a newspaper in there or brochure for their vacation or something like that. They worked on paper, they relaxed their brains on paper. Working in the digital world is very, very consuming of mental energy. I think people need those moments of being able to step away for a second and do something. And clearly there's a line where we don't want to, I mean, I've got a few, I don't want to lose productivity on them also. But I also think that the biggest problem with the whole model is that the moment we turn IT into police officers with stuff like this, we lose the trust of the user base and the whole game's over. They're never gonna report it when they've made a mistake for fear of being on the wrong side of that policy line. So, you know, I, I would say the, the, the trick is to harden the edge of the network and the technologies you've got for detection. And then, uh, you know, keep an eye on it and deal with the real problem users and skip the rest. But on the whole, you feel like a lot of systems are really geared towards finding Yeah, I mean, I'm dealing with attacks every single day with clients. We have a cyber practice. I'm working on nine different events right now that were brought to me by various agencies. I don't have anybody that was attacked over something simple like that. They're getting smacked with zero day attacks and really sophisticated movement. Um, not so much that little edge stuff anymore. Great, great. If I can add to it right there. If you want to be the police, um, <laughs> so you can't stop them from doing it on their mobile phone, right? But if you still want to do it, there is technology to it today, right? So on the edge, you know, there are vendors that actually have web proxies. You can configure them to filter for keywords. You can block certain things, right? When the user actually goes in, it'll tell them, you're not authorized to go um, access this using your company resources. If you think this is an error, you can ask them to contact with IT. So there are things you can do. Technology exists for you to do it. But the question is, you know, how, how far, um, how much you want to police your people? You mentioned one of our biggest threats, I believe, to most of us is insider threats, right? Our own employees. Can you refresh for us what are actionable items that we can recommend to our staff in order to make them better aware, better equipped to protect our data? Yeah, um, I'll start. Maybe Todd, you can add to it, right? When I think of um, managing insider threat, uh, I think you have to address it um, in multiple ways, right? First one is education. Everybody has a cyber program, but oftentimes what we see is it's once a year, check the box kind of thing. But how do you actually make it more meaningful for the user, right? So we at Deloitte, um, we have this series called Don't Be That Guy series. Um, it's, it's, it's a quick you know, five minute um, video that we do, a scenario played out and said don't do it, right? Little things like don't be traveling in, in the elevator or in, you know, middle of 30 Rockefeller Center and talk about your client getting breached, right? Little things that you do. Um, so thinking of innovative ways to educate users is probably important, right? Um, the other, so that takes care of sort of what I call people doing things without just knowing, like no malicious intent. The other side of it is um, people who actually have malicious intent. This is where you should have good controls, right? So if your system administrators are leaving the company, you should have a process to rotate administrative privileges and credentials and things like that, right? So having some processes around elevating risk for key people is important, right? And then the last piece, I think we talked about it, right, is this behavior-based um, analysis. So what we're seeing a lot of organizations embark on is what we call an insider threat management program, right? So it starts with the right policy. There's technology out there today that you can deploy 
that starts observing user behavior and it assigns a risk score to what a user is doing, and then it can take actions based on what you want to do, right? So again, multiple ways of looking at it. It starts with education, start with good processes and hygiene around things to do and keep people lean the organization, and then of course, you know, the, the broader program to catch up. So I'm gonna give you two terms that if you were gonna write something down, write these down. Least privileged access. Ask your IT departments what you're doing for least privileged access. The concept is that we don't assign privileges to a user that they don't need. And a lot of organizations, a lot of IT departments aren't that sophisticated yet. You may get a quick and somewhat glib response from an IT person saying, oh yeah, yeah, we never give people more than they need. The next question is, well then, how do you monitor for privilege creep? Privilege creep, that's the term. So how do we know month over month that somebody hasn't added privileges to an account, maybe during testing and then didn't remove them or added them erroneously? That's, I mean, managing identity is managing inside a threat. Uh, under the, just a question in terms of the legal aspect, do, do we get involved, do the lawyers get involved in drafting the incident response plan and then implementing it? So um, the incident response plan is gonna be different for every organization, but there are obviously gonna be a lot of similarities. It, just depends on how big your company is, right? How many departments, how many different people are gonna be, or different touch points that are gonna, you're gonna have. Um, but this is not rocket science, right? But it should be done by someone who is ultimately, like I said earlier, gonna be the quarterback of the process, so that you just have this, it's, it's a cheat sheet, right? Like, who does what, and what are their phone numbers, what are their email addresses? Um, and it's just amazing when, because when the, when the stuff hits the fan, um, as it will um, inevitably for some of you, it's just hard to, to stop the chaos, right? It, it is a very chaotic couple of days. You hope it's just a couple of days when this thing surfaces and you just wanna have this cheat sheet so that you know who am I supposed to call and what are they gonna do about it, right? I think part of our discussion was really to like help with the preparedness, right? If you're a very small business, if it's not your main business, you know, is there a set, set package to, to get this done? Right. So, yeah, put that together. So on that last subject there, if you're part of a small business and you're in a, in a niche industry, talk to your industry associations. If you're a manufacturer, the Manufacturers Alliance has a program for small businesses that help them get through this. A lot of industry organizations have taken that path because it's too hard for a small business to handle it solo. You know, I'll just add one last thing to this, right? As we think about an incident response plan, I always think about an incident commander. Think about who that is in your organization because that can't be you. You are a CEO and you still have a lot of business. I've seen situations where a CEO tends to become an incident commander and that does not go well. How do you measure how much uh, internal resources versus external? External seems a little bit easier to me, so maybe specifically, you know, what kind of internal resources do you need as a medium sized business? Did everybody hear that? Talking about resources. Are you talking about in the like Should we hire a whole security department internally or yeah. rely more on external? How, how do we kind of measure which Yeah, I, I would say to that, it's, it's not about quantity, it's about quality, right? I've seen security functions with as low as six, seven people who run very smart, effective programs, and I've seen 30, 40 plus people just sitting there as long in benches, right? So the, 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 the question, I think, needs to be looked at at um, what are your priorities, what are you trying to tackle, and how well are you employing technology and automation to effectively do this, right? So, you know, I, I know I'm not answering the question straight, uh, but the, what, what you need to look at is what are the five to 10 things that we're gonna focus on that's gonna make sense for us, and what's the team that we need to do this right, right? And sometimes it means outsourcing some functions, right? Maybe outsourcing a full security operations to a third party helps you focus on something else. Um, so my identity management. We had uh, uh, great conversations with lots of insights. One interesting question perspective that came up has to do with the fact that, you know, we may have our own internal infrastructure, but um, in today's ecosystem, we rely on third parties, outside vendors, software as a service, and, um, it was shared that, yeah, we have liability for that data as well. So with that understanding, what guidance would you give everyone here around um, how to select, what to look out for when selecting those third party partners, 
And how often should we revisit that relationship to stay safe? So I want to restart with that one. So okay. Sure. Why? Because I because I smirked at it. No. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> yeah. um, no. I mean, you know, when there are, I tell people when they're searching for for um, new software, there are four specific things that I look for in a new provider every time. And if it, they don't meet all four of these, they're not on my list. Period. Don't look at them. No matter how good the workflow is. Number one, identity integration has to be able to take identity from my primary identity provider. If I'm with Google Identity Shop, then it's got to integrate with Google. If I'm with Microsoft Shop, it's got to integrate with my Microsoft. I don't take software that has its own username and password database. I just don't do it. Number two, it has to be able to support uh, um, data access, open data access for analytics and reporting. Number three, has to be able to uh, support automation. Number four, has to integrate to whatever our primary communications platform is. If you're a Slack company, great, it's gotta integrate the Slack. If you're in Teams, it needs to integrate the Teams. Those four things, if it doesn't do all four, don't even look at it. Let me just make a quick, just yeah, a quick follow-up on that too. <clears throat> With respect to your contracts with your vendors also, you wanna be looking for indemnification provisions. You wanna make sure that, I mean, the context, if you're doing anything that touches healthcare, the law requires that you have business associate agreements, right? So this is, this is not something to be taken lightly because if you don't do this stuff, the, the penalties are staggering. They're, they, they are existential. You know, I'll, I'll add this, right? We always tell people, <laughs> have a good third party risk management program, right? So that goes from onboarding a third party to offboarding a third party, right? Because mm -hmm. a lot of times people take care of the onboarding, right? They'll have the right contracts in place. They might even do the ongoing management. They might even do any audits or just asking for stock reports, but a lot of times people don't do offboarding, right? So if you terminate a contract, how do you know that your data is still out there? How do you know that they're actually living to their obligations, right? So having an entire program end to end and, and diligently following that up is important, right? Now, all third parties are not the same, so you have to think based on risk tier to figure out what high risk for you and probably have more scrutiny on them as opposed to 